برحب بحضراتكم جميعا في الويبينار الخاص بالنسيج اكاديمي وان شاء الله تبقى سيشن مفيده ومثريه لينا و I'd like at the beginning to introduce uh, uh, Professor Clara. Professor Clara, uh, she's a director of the Martinson Center for International Library Programs uh, and uh, Martinson Distinguished Professor at University of Illinois Urbana Campaign Library. She also specialized in social construction of library and information use and practice and systems that, that impact access and the collective memory in uh, multicultural communities. Dr. Clara, uh, as well, she is uh, published a leading journal and taught, uh, trained, uh, and presented at conference around the world uh, in both language, English and Spanish. And uh, I assume that she picked some Arabic from me in. Uh, in the times that we meet each other. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, but I think the most important thing that uh, Dr. Clara is uh, one of the uh, senior consultants in the World Library and also uh, have a strategic vision for different libraries all over the world. Uh, today's session, I think it will be great to let her introduce her because we're uh, all curious about the smart as a term and how to make our libraries uh, smarter. Uh, thank you again for attending this one, and we uh, will welcome everybody who will join us ahead for the coming two or three minutes. So I would like to uh, leave the stage for Dr. Clara to uh, start the webinar. Please go ahead, Dr. Clara. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. Abdallah Metwali. And I'd like to also thank the Nasich Academy for the opportunity to be able to have a conversation about the smart and smarter library. So we can talk about what that means and it will be an introduction that allows us to have a conversation about what the many opportunities are in the future. And just to give you a sense of how I would like to be able to do this session, I'd like to use the first um, about 40 minutes or so to do uh, the presentation. Then um, if you have some questions, then you can write it on the chat and I will be able to address those after my presentation. And um, at which point then we would be able to either use the microphone at that point uh, if you wish, or we can just use the chat. And so I'd like to begin um, now my presentation focusing on this notion of what makes smart libraries, and then more importantly, what makes them smarter. So as you were able to read in the description of this session, I am going to focus on smart technology, smart strategies, and smarter libraries. So it's those strategies, that intentional part, thinking about the uh, what is it that uh, is brought to the library to adopt a smart strategy makes them smarter. And uh, my expectation is that webinar participants will be able to understand different ways to consider the notion of smart and smarter libraries, learn about smart technologies for libraries, and be mindful of social traits, such as inclusivity and equity in designing smarter libraries. So I really want us to think about that. And so to be able to understand how is it that we can be tapping or leveraging smarter solutions. And we are now in an information landscape where it's very open. So if we ask certain questions about who creates the content, now we know that almost anybody can and can be published. We also know that the form that information takes, uh, it can be uh, oral or it could be textual or it could be multimedia. And so the form that it takes can vary a lot. And then what sense do we use? Uh, so we can listen to something and soon we might even be able to touch a screen and actually feel if it's something that's hot, the temperature. And if we are touching the side of a mountain, we might be able to feel how rough it is. And so we can engage many of our senses. And if that's the case, then we want to ensure that we understand the concept of transliteracy and that means accessing any content in whichever form it is and being able to easily transition from one to the other. And then we ask uh, the question, where do we access this information? And actually, it could be anywhere. And where are these products housed? They can be 
in private collections or public collections such as our academic uh, public uh, libraries. Uh, they can be in institutions then and in many other places. So depending on where and how easily accessible it is, then uh, we would be able to have uh, uh, access to it. And then who is accessing this information? It can be anyone anywhere in the world. And in some cases, um, there may be a charge or it may be all free. Uh, but uh, now anyone who has access to most of the technologies can have access to information. And so how do we access it? It could be an analog form, digital form. We are using mobile technologies and portable technologies to be able to access much of this data. And then how do we engage with it? We can read uh, or look at a video on our own or we can be connected with others and be able to use that information with others. And so what we see is that the role of the library, because of this information landscape that's evolving, then it is changing. And so if we look at the changing role of the academic library as an example, then we can see that we used to collect uh, materials historically just in case people might need it, right? And then, uh, then we more recently started to collect uh, materials just to make sure that people have it uh, when they hope to use it. And then uh, in the future, it's going to be, we may not know all the different demands, but that's okay because it's going to be available on demand in at any time. And so that has also evolved in terms of another area, which is our space. Uh, we used to have space that was not as much widely available. The focus was ensuring that the collections were there. And so the space was very fixed. Uh, there were the bookshelves and other kinds of furniture. And so there wasn't that possibility to be able to adjust and meet the changing needs of the use of the library space in a more flexible manner. And so the emerging trend is to have more flexible user-focused space. And then uh, in the future, the space will be even more uh, flexible, meaning that it may not necessarily be physically in the library. It could be online. It's collaborative with others. Uh, and it could be also in other locations, such as in an academic department where some a librarian may be embedded. And so uh, if you access this particular uh, graphic, then you can see that there is the changing needs and needs that uh, are evolving, many of them because of the way that we can access information and the kinds of technologies that allow us to access that information as well as the fact that many of our materials are electronic and therefore we may not need as much space to be able to house them and have particular, uh, you know, increasing number of bookshelves or we can house many of these things off-site. And so if we then look at what does this mean for any type of library, then we see that smart libraries are an evolving concept. And so I'm going just to share a few definitions to have us think about what those opportunities are. And so if I quote from the work of Linda Freeberg, then she indicates that smart libraries facilitate the integration of digital processes and information feedback loops in the organizational structure. So that means that digitally we're able to obtain data, we're able to uh, process that data and use it in a function uh, that may be pre-programmed to be able to help uh, and in enhance the functionality of our organization. So by organization, I mean not just the library itself, but our larger organization. So that's why we see articles that talk about smart libraries and smart cities. And so we can say the same thing in terms of an academic or special library where we have smart libraries, then we have smarter organizations, smart universities. And so what's happening here is the integration um, and where there is the 
uh, desirable state of a smarter institution, whether that's a city, whether that's uh, a university, et cetera. And so what we have then with smart libraries, we have more efficiently organized, resource-friendly, flexible, sustainable, and green, and socially inclusive uh, libraries. So these are some of the conditions. And so to focus back on the notion of smart, uh, the adjective, then when we're using it uh, with relation to libraries, then we're referring to the efficiency due to the use of technologies and to an automation of processes to facilitate the working and everyday environment. So uh, SMART tends to focus on those specific aspects where technologies are being deployed. And so if we continue to look at uh, more definitions of uh, smart libraries, then we find that uh, Chip Weston uh, describes smart libraries that are able to deploy technologies that connect them and monitor almost every object in our lives, smartphones uh, or um, adding other devices, process real-time data to enhance our lives. So enhancing our lives is important and our communities and uh, it allows us to better predict future needs. And so a smart library is constantly assessing and ranking the needs of the local community so that relevant programs can be created, funded, evaluated, enhanced, and sustained. And so smart libraries play a major role in the creation of network and more sustainable communities. So it can address individual needs, but it really allows us to look at ways that we can address those needs long term as well as for the whole community. And so if we look at what helps us to think about smart libraries, then I am referring to a particular conference that took place a couple years ago. And the conference focused on sustainable academic libraries. And I want to use their thematic areas as a way for us to really think about what are those things are changing, what are those things that we can address as we're thinking about creating those smarter libraries. So smarter libraries then would allow us to have environments that are sustainable. So are those environments uh, green? Are those environments uh, responsible in terms of uh, being ecology friendly? Then we need uh, resources that are sustainable. Are the resources that we purchase ones that we can preserve for long term? Are they ones that we can make accessible? Or is it a situation where we uh, subscribe to particular resources and after we're not able to pay, then we no longer have access to those resources. Then we also need to think about sustainable technology. <clears throat> if we use certain technologies such as cloud uh, resources, then is everyone able to access them? Will we be able to sustain them long term? Uh, are the technologies we're buying now, are they going to still be uh, relevant and applicable for a uh, long term? And so, or does this require us to keep on changing technology? So sustainability of the technologies that we use are very important. And then the last is that we have sustainable practices. That means, are we delivering services that are strategic? Are we delivering services that are appropriate to our user needs and our institutional mission. And so these services can't just be responding to uh, using some new technology because everybody else is using it or because it's new and you think that uh, it might be a good solution for something. We need to be able to tie it back to our raison d'etre. That means, you know, is it relevant to our own and the institutional mission? as well as are we able to uh, benchmark and determine that the new approaches or strategies that we are initiating are relevant and we can show that uh, they are enhancing the services that we provide and uh, not only enhancing them, but they are being used. So we see that what is evolving is in this smart library environment, we need to talk about, uh, if we go back to that framework I just described, the environments, the resources, the technology, and the services. 
And then I wanted to add also that that means that if these particular areas in the libraries are changing, then our practices are also changing. And so that means our skills and the way that we engage with our user population. And so our user population may not be an interaction that's physical. It may be interactions in other modes, whether it might be sending them a text message, or it could be an email, or it could be uh, virtually uh, at the same time through video. There are many ways that we can now uh, wish to and consider engaging with our uh, users. And so with the different environments, then we create more smart spaces, resources. We create smart resources, smart devices. And we also would, uh, in terms of a service, then uh, also uh, produce uh, smart search services. And so when we're thinking about the librarians, then we know that we are enhancing our skills to be able to offer these services as smart librarians and that our interactions will be using uh, the relevant technologies and that will make us be able to be uh, cost effective in how we engage with our users. So to give you examples of those four areas, the environment, the uh, resources, et cetera, then I'm going to share a few examples. And so first are smart spaces. And so with smart spaces, we see uh, in many libraries, and uh, I'm imagining that in many of yours also, that the spaces are now open and that they are flexible, meaning that users can determine uh, how they might want to use some of the furniture, how they would want to use the space. And so you may want to push a chair more to the side because you want to study more independently or you might push some of the furniture together because you want to be able to study with a group. And so there are open spaces as well as dedicated meeting rooms that can be converted to classrooms uh, or can be created for uh, project meeting rooms, et cetera. So this is all possible in the image there of the Hunt Library at North Carolina State University is an example of that. Then I wanted to show a public library example, and that is uh, the concept that is being adopted by a uh, public library in the UK. And the concept of the smart library there is a library that users, uh, once they are given a, a card, they can access the library that is not staff. So you can access all the library services by going physically <clears throat> inside the library where uh, <coughs> where uh, the library is accessible to users during particular times, even though they may not be staffed there. And so it's not open, uh, in this particular case, it's not open 24-7, but it is open after the staff is not uh, working. And so it makes accessible all those resources uh, that would not need uh, a staff to answer a question, for example. And so that makes uh, the uh, space uh, a smart use of it. Then we can have a smart resources. And I just wanted to uh, show some examples of um, that smart resources uh, also need to be marketed. And so this is a particular uh, uh, images from a campaign to um, promote the library services at the University of California at Irvine. And uh, SOT is just a uh, name that they use for their uh, mascot at the university, which is an anteater. And so uh, SOT is just a unique word to that university. And so by Smarter, then they are promoting their smart resources, as you can see, the various uh, types of materials that they have. And also part of their smart resources are their smart librarians, so specialized librarians that you can see that they have um, uh, specialization in certain subject areas uh, and are available for consultation. Then in terms of smart devices, I just wanted to give you uh, an example of a few of them. <clears throat> One is um, 
thinking about how we can be smarter is to not just focus on any uh, technology, but to really think about uh, bridging the gap for those who would have a disability in using technological resources and other resources. And so I encourage uh, you to, as you're thinking about smarter libraries, to think about technologies and software that provide access uh, for people with disabilities. Other smart devices and or software then are uh, going to uh, help us to deliver other kinds of services. Some of you are already delivering uh, some of these services and others might be thinking about them. And that is uh, simple augmented reality or in some university libraries and it's uh, quite enhanced because of the visualization walls, um, screens that allow us to be able to see larger images as well as uh, the uh, glasses that would allow us to view uh, something as if we're experiencing it for ourselves. So uh, what simple or, or regular augmented reality is that libraries are able to create experiences that using the virtual accessible technologies allow us to actually experience um, something as if we are actually there. So whether it's visiting a new site uh, that you've never gone to physically, uh, or it could be that you are now learning how you might go about uh, doing heart, sur heart surgery, for example, because you would be able to put on the virtual reality um, glasses and be able to experience uh, yourself uh, doing the uh, heart surgery. <clears throat> then we know uh, many of you uh, might already have wearable technology, so whether it's a watch or whether you have a jacket with certain smart technology sewn in, uh, wearable technology is going to allow us to not only access information as users, uh, but for us who are in libraries be able to curate information, push out information, deliver information, and have people access it quite readily and um, have it uh, more or less 24-7 as they wish to. The uh, other uh, area that we can be thinking about is uh, to use RFID, uh, radio frequency identification technology. We use it uh, in our materials right now in our book to ensure that things, uh, our materials are checked in and checked out properly, uh, as well as uh, for security purposes to ensure that some um, individuals who uh, haven't had a chance to check out the materials, if they walk out of the library with it, that uh, there is an alarm that uh, uh, it rings because uh, it's activated because the material hasn't been properly checked out. But such implanted technology is not just going to be in uh, books, uh, but in other materials, but it can, uh, and it, in some cases, it's already implanted in people and in animals, et cetera. And so there's a way for us to be able to not only gather data from sensors as well as push out data. And so this brings up what we know as the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is the ability to connect uh, information that is available through different means. What is happening is that information is gathered through sensors, then we can tap into that information, and that information allows the smart technologies to respond. Some of us may already have uh, this in place in our homes, such as with our thermostats. We now have smart thermostats that allow us to sense the temperature and ensure that it's at the particular level throughout the whole household without needing uh, for us to go and adjust uh, manually the temperature. And so the Internet of Things is being uh, made, uh, it's being applied in many different ways in libraries. And so I'm going to show one particular example, and that is with what is called iBeacon technology. So iBeacon technology are these sensors that uh, were created by Apple, and now there are various other 
uh, brands that are out there. And so these small sensors can be placed in different parts of the library. And they are programmed, so then it allows us to be able to program information that then if our users download our application, information can be pushed towards them. So it could announce things like new programs because uh, they are walking by the front desk or as they're leaving the library, if they have an overview book, then that particular information will be pushed uh, uh, and appear on their uh, cellular phone. And if they're interested, if in their profile there is an interest in uh, cooking, then as the user is walking by the cooking section, information about new books or uh, any programs that relate to cooking would be uh, would appear on their cell phone. So it's a way for us to be able to uh, ensure that our users get personalized information regarding different aspects of our library, whether uh, new services, new materials, or uh, administrative materials such as the fact that they have an overdue book and need to pay the overdue fine. So here is just an example of an actual uh, ID can, um, implementation at a community uh, college library. And in this community college library, then they are able to see, uh, to show uh, through this article that it was very easy to program where they place certain uh, ID can sensors and it allows someone that uh, has just identified that they need to locate a particular book instead of trying to figure out where it is um, in which bookshelf or which section of the library or which floor of the library it's in, that uh, their app would actually show them the way. They would just follow their instructions on their phone to be able to reach the materials. And so this is just a way that uh, the user uh, can reduce their time instead of thinking, oh, you know, how do I figure out where that book is on the bookshelf? Uh, they just follow their the instructions as they're guided through their cell phone. So then the fourth area is uh, smart search. And so in this example of smart search, then the St. Paul Public Library has developed instructions. So then uh, users are able to know how to search in a smarter way the materials that can be found at the St. Paul Public Library. And then depending on the uh, li on other search engines and other libraries, then potentially materials that are not just in the library itself, but materials that are outside of the library within a consortium of materials that they can actually uh, borrow through interlibrary loan. And so uh, through the smart search approach, they teach about how to use filters and how to hone in on the search and ensure that they are able to do a search that is not broad, but is more specific to the needs that they have. So then to just emphasize again, what does it mean being smarter, not just smart? So when I talk about being smarter, I want us to really think about the uh, human or the uh, intervention that is critical, as well as the context. So to think about where we're working, what resources we actually have, and whether it makes sense uh, for our user community to be able to implement uh, smart technology. So being smarter is taking those uh, aspects into account and not to just uh, focus on being intelligent, meaning using, just because they're available, digital data <clears throat> digital data driven technological solutions and advances and so i want us to think about what you see on your left hand column that uh, smarter libraries are ones that are strategic and intentional you know we know why we're implementing something why we're adopting something and then also uh, because we are strategic then we want to be able to think about any possibility and think beyond the traditional. So it allows us to be innovative 
and to ensure that we not duplicate our efforts and leverage various resources across many institutions. We are collaborative or we're also collaborative within our own library. Uh, different departments can join together to buy certain materials. Then it also, uh, being smarter is a meaning to be interdisciplinary, that we tap into other ways of thinking, other disciplines and how they approach something, and also the library can offer that particular uh, uh, way to examine interdisciplinary solutions for researchers, for students. And so not only are librarians uh, able to work interdisciplinary, but also we create spaces for interdisciplinary thinking in our library. And then important to the work that I'm very interested in is that these solutions be culturally relevant. And so that means that if we apply these technologies, then is everybody going to be able to access it based on the resources that they have, the way that they uh, view the world, the way that they are able to engage with different types of context as well as different types of technological solutions. And then, of course, smarter means being sustainable, to really look at solutions if we can consider how sustainable they are. And, of course, um, smart then looks at technologies that are interoperable, that are cost effective, that are open, etc. So many of the other elements of smart solutions we are more familiar with, so I wanted to focus on this notion of uh, thinking about those particular elements that make us smarter. Then um, what makes us smarter is to really recognize some of the changes that are taking place in our context, uh, our social, our educational and other contexts. And so one particular area that we can all be addressing in any type of library is this notion of personalized learning. And personalized learning, whether it's you know a student or a professional or a researcher, means that technologies allow us to adapt and provide information that is relevant based on the uh, the time that somebody wants the information, the location, as well as the pace of learning. Some people may be more advanced uh, in a particular class and some people might be a little bit slower. So personalized learning allows that kind of flexibility. And in this kind of situation, then the teacher um, is not just uh, the expert, but it the teacher is a facilitator of knowledge, and so we can consider librarians also as those facilitators of knowledge, that we can be uh, as much in terms of being experts, knowing where the information is, but also providing resources that allow our users to analyze, to easily use, and uh, for example, if the information is needed in another language, to be able to provide the information in a language that is relevant to the needs of the user. And so when we have personalized learning, then we now have this new kind of learner, this now a, a citizen that is called a nomad. And so a nomad is a person that is using mobile technology, that wants to learn uh, anywhere that they are in the world. They are not bound by time. And so when we're thinking as public or academic or any type of library, how do we try to provide to this new user, the nomad? And so we need to be able to respond in a way that allows us to be flexible in uh, keeping up with new technologies and different ways to deliver them 24-7. And so just to give you an example of what the changes that might already be seen in uh, your local context or uh, you might be introduced to this for the first time are what are called flipped classrooms where uh, the design that you see in front of you is uh, from a particular project 
which is called scale up, where the teacher is at the center and the students are around the teacher. And so this means that the students are able to read the content for the class before they get to the class. And then in class, during you know, a flipped classroom session, then the students are doing their assignments. Or if they've already finished it in their head, then they might be helping others, or they might be uh, reading up on other things, building on the class that they already have. So if you can see when the flipped classroom is actually active, then uh, there is a lot of movement. It's very dynamic. Some people are studying on their own. Some people are studying together, and so this allows for different types of learning that is actually preferred by the users. And so with the librarian, we need to be able to think about how is it that we support teaching, both the instructor as well as learning the students in this kind of new environment. So with personalized learning, then we need technology that can help professors or teachers differentiate instruction, and so that means to provide uh, instruction that can respond to uh, different user needs, and to think differently about the delivery of instructional content. So libraries enable them to efficiently and effectively search, discover, and select the best sources to help students succeed in their courses. And so we uh, have tended to do this, but we are now doing it in this new learning environment. And so we can also take advantage if we have access to data. If we have access to data about how well students are doing or the courses that they have taken, um, how well they're um, uh, advancing in their studies, then with this particular data uh, of their successes as well as their obstacles, their barriers in success, then uh, the analysis of such data, the what's called learning analytics, enable us to provide content recommendations uh, based on what we know about uh, students and or uh, faculty preference. So for example, we know that a student has not yet finished a particular assignment. We know that in that particular course, the faculty member has requested that they use at least 10 um, uh, uh, entries from an encyclopedia. If that's the case, then we want to be able to suggest content, recommend a bit, uh, certain uh, types of encyclopedias so then the students will have easy access to them. And so content is then pushed to individuals, or if not to the individuals, then to the course site. And so through the course site, then it's accessible to the students through the learning management system that is being employed at the particular school or university. And so whether that's Moodle, Blackboard, uh, Canvas, et cetera. So content access, when we want to be able to provide solutions, then they can be uh, solutions of data or information that the library already owns, or it can be just data that we host, meaning that we don't necessarily own it, or if we're in a consortium that we have access to them. So then we are both, when it comes to content, providing access as well as now with the smart technologies being able to push data, recommend data that our users can use to enhance their particular Lives. So whether uh, it's as a student, a teacher, et cetera. And so if we look at kind of different levels of solutions, then traditionally then we have provided uh, the search interface. So then through searches and uh, trying to provide advanced search features, then that can provide a solution to be able to find information. Another is if we try to curate content, that means that we either develop a bibliographic guide or a, another type of similar tool where we are able to provide information that is both a little bit uh, broad because it gives a general overview as well as some specifics uh, to get in depth 
at a particular topic, we can develop these particular uh, resources, which is part of what is now called content curation, or through linked data, then when someone searches for a topic, then in the search results, what may come up, uh, as we now see on Google, if we search uh, Apple, let's say on Google, then typically on the side we can find information about nutrition and other things related to the Apple. Or if we search on Google a particular person, then typically on the side we find uh, information regarding the uh, biography and other resources. So uh, libraries are now starting to employ linked data solutions where if we search for a particular topic, let's say uh, a particular musician, Mozart, then uh, apart from what is available at that particular library, then we might have a screen on the side that is uh, available to, through the process of linked data where it shows um, the, the actual audio recordings that are available at a particular uh, music library in another country, uh, or it could be the catalog of uh, another university that has the best Mozart collection, or it could be a link uh, to the actual exhibit that might be taking place in a nearby museum. And so there are many ways that we can now curate data or make uh, specific data available through uh, linked data solutions. And then the last is um, if we're not able to uh, provide personal solutions, we can provide those solutions at the course level. That means that we can support instructors to develop and provide the resources that are needed so then students can um, readily do their uh, study and become more informed in the course topic or go beyond the particular material and content being covered in a course. And so these particular solutions are ones that are not as personalized because what we're finding at the moment is that institutions are not able to, uh, because of security issues and um, personal identity issues, that uh, the personal data that we might want to access in a particular library, such as uh, somebody's uh, performance in a course, how well they're doing in their studies, that information may not be readily available. And so these particular solutions that are indicated are ones that we can be very helpful, but uh, not worried that we need to be able to provide them because we don't have access to the particular educational or uh, academic performance of an individual. And so the data that we can make accessible now uh, ranges all the way from raw data, uh, data collected for an experiment that has not even been interpreted, to uh, research data that has been interpreted, or uh, to individuals who are experts in the field. And so we can be connected to various types of information depending on what might be needed. So I talked about content curation and I wanted to focus a little bit on this because this is an area where as librarians we would be able to identify particular uh, topics that might be ones that our students need, our faculty might want, uh, students to have access to. And so when we're thinking about uh, curating content, then what uh, it's enabling us to do is to address certain types of criteria, whether it's um, what thinking is needed to be able to curate, uh, what is what process is needed, how do we organize it, etc. When we're thinking about, if we look at the middle column, if we're thinking about collecting information the way that we have traditionally, then we tend to, at the thinking level, classify books, right? These are all books on a history, or these are all books on the history of uh, Italy. 
And if we think about curating, when we take it to the next level of where we are trying to gather information that is readily accessible, especially through the internet, then we are able to tap in more and uh, really not just um, uh, uh, identify materials that are at that broader level, but be more specific and also keep more up to date and be able to update these uh, curated resources. And so uh, what you see here is the differentiation between what we might have traditionally done uh, when we are collecting and what we can now do when we're curating. So um, the one area that I want to highlight is that the value that we bring when we are offering just our uh, material collection is that it can meet the personal interest and its uh, value to the uh, collector. So it could be ourselves as the library or others. And quantity matters. While when we're curating data, when we're developing a particular uh, uh, information guide, then it meets a particular learning goal. It's a value to the collector as well as the learner. And so it emphasizes both aspects. We make a personal uh, connection, and it's the quality that matters. We want to make sure that we select uh, the materials that will be meeting those specific, more specific, relevant needs. And so when we're curating data, when we're developing these very specialized guides, uh, content tools uh, on a particular topic, then we also tap into the various literacies that are indicated, whether it's uh, traditional, we build on by information literacy, visual, critical, media, and tool literacy. And I see that we're getting close to the end, so I am also uh, very close to the end here. So one of the important things, as we can see with smart technologies, is that we not just want to have collections of materials, but those collections need to go beyond. The librarians need to create those services that allow us to better access and engage and experience the content that is in our library. And so I want to end with some key factors in the success of smart programs. We want to make sure that they, we have sustainable revenue, so the resources are sustainable. We are sharing that we develop new governance models that we able to are able to measure the outcome, that we crowdsource, that we don't just rely on ourselves to develop um, the materials, and that we have real-time information that's relevant, that we be able to access uh, broadband, and that we ensure that there is protection of privacy. And so these are just some of the ways that we can ensure success. And with that, then I close the presentation. And uh, uh, I think it was a very interesting webinar. Uh, I can see at the uh, last slide, uh, Dr. Clara convert herself from the academia to be a terrorist. So she gave us uh, a prescription for how to convert our libraries to be a smarter library. So uh, it, it's so interesting also, I think, uh, focusing on uh, smart librarian and also uh, the smart way to uh, manipulate the financial issues for libraries, I think it's a very important a very liberalization uh, should be done from the uh, library perspective for these uh, types of smart. Uh, also, I would like just to leave the, the stage for anyone need to ask, please, uh, uh, Clara, you can just read the comments or question down there from uh, uh, the attendees and uh, answer for it, please. I have a wonderful question from Amal. So, hi, Amal. <laughs> How are you? Uh, you were asking about what real-world use means. So, real-world use would be anything that reflects the actual reality, the everyday experience of the user. And so, from the uh, student perspective, then that would mean both uh, their academic needs as well as uh, their personal needs. So they 
might be wanting to buy a new backpack and so they need to find that information and then it's not just about the textbooks that they might need that would go into the backpack for example uh, they may have be having challenges getting to the university and so what is the best public transportation now that they no longer have a car and so real world just means to recognize that we don't live in a vacuum so if there are changes, if all of a sudden there's a hurricane, uh, then we know that uh, students would need specialized information because uh, their houses, maybe um, their family homes have been flooded or other things are taking place. Uh, yes, so uh, the <clears throat> one question is about uh, standards for adopting uh, technology and software for people with disabilities. And uh, there are, and so what we need to look at are, uh, you can search some international standards. Uh, there are also uh, some exceptions to rules. For example, the Marrakesh Treaty allows uh, anyone in the world um, that is working uh, in a library to be able to convert something that is in print to be accessible in another format so people who have visual disabilities are able to use those materials and we would not be breaking uh, uh, we would uh, there wouldn't be any copyright uh, problem with that so that's the Marrakesh Treaty then in the United States then we have very uh, specific guidelines in terms of disabilities and so those uh, can be searched and then in terms of just technology use and disabilities then um, there are also standards that what you know, things uh, I don't have all the different um, uh, the different standards at hand but if you do the research then it's uh, they're pretty straightforward and easy to find what I think um, it's more uh, it's more difficult is for libraries to be compliant because even though we know that we want to provide that access oftentimes the additional work that is needed um, it can be a bit of an obstacle and slow down the process. And just as an example, when um, we were uh, going to redesign our website at my university, then we wanted to make sure that it was accessible for people with disabilities. And so one of the things that is used is uh, the cursor. So one would click to go down. So instead of using the mouse the way that we can uh, go from one uh, area of the other in our screen with our mouse and our cursor, then we had to create web pages that only by clicking and pressing down on a button can we go from one uh, tab to the next tab. Okay. And then uh, there was a question about making the materials available. So I don't know what um, Message Academy does in terms of. Uh, I think the recording is made accessible. Yes, I can answer this one. Usually we do uh, some sort of uh, uh, marketing for the, the workshop and other events like webinar, but it takes some time for the editing and final tuning. But at least we will uh, uh, publish the presentation on slide share on the academic, uh, academic website link. Also, the, the recording. It depends about how it's clear, but the most important thing, everyone attend this uh, webinar will get a certificate for uh, attending. And also we will open it for any question, you can send it to us over the uh, Message Academy. One more thing I need to announce, uh, uh, Dr. Clara mentioned the IoT or Internet of Things uh, as a part of the uh, smart library approach. And we'd like to announce that on the upcoming uh, conference on SLA AGC, Muqtamar Gaiyat al Makhlal Mutakhassasa, which will uh, be held on uh, March, we will have uh, a pre conference, uh, two workshops, one in Arabic language and the other one in uh, English. It will uh, focus on Internet of Things, which is the theme, the theme of the uh, conference. Uh, also, um, I don't know if it's a little bit uh, aside of the uh, of the webinar, but the next month we will have on 28th and 29th workshop on the leadership in libraries. 
so we invite you just to uh, attend it. It will be on uh, Dubai. So we opened the registration for it, and it's, it's uh, uh, open for everyone interested in this and to attend it there. Uh, again, I hope that if anyone just having any question, otherwise would like to wrap up and thank Dr. Clara so much. You always impressing me about uh, what you uh, deliver uh, for uh, the academia and also for the libraries in the uh, Arab region and all over the world. Uh, um, that's all what uh, we have for today. And please, uh, uh, Clara, if you need just to uh, wrapping up with a special word or something like that, please be my guest. Okay, uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope all of you will think about uh, engaging these tools because they're important for us to provide more direct responsive services, but also keep in mind the social context and why we're doing it. So thank you so much and good luck with uh, experimenting and trying new ways to make your library smarter. Thank you, Clara. Thank you for everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.